Studios in New York City. This is Charlie Rose. Eric Kandel is a Nobel Prize winner in medicine and a university professor at, at Columbia University here in New York. He is one of the world's leading neuroscientists and has dedicated his life to the study of the brain. His new book is called In Search of Memory, The Emergence of a New Science of Mind. It's both an, an autobiography and at the same time a history of the field of neuroscience. Welcome. Thank you, Harold. Delighted to be here. Eric, one of the extraordinary things about your book for me, who coincidentally happened to read it last That's week, right. <laughs> is that it operates on several levels at once, as a personal history, as a history of the field of neuroscience, and as a history of your own work in that field. And for that reason, it resonates in several ways. It introduces the reader to um, the idea of the mind as an object of objective study. It uh, gives us a feel for how a science evolves. It talks about how science is a network of individuals working together to unravel the mysteries of life. And it talks about the impact of science on society. And I'd like to try to explore some of those themes with you. I think all readers will appreciate the way in which the book begins with a, a literal bang, with a bang on the door that is, an, is a, at once an example of what memory can mean and how extraordinary a phenomenon it is and also a way for you to pull the reader into an effort to, to try to explain what memory is and, uh, and how important it is to, to individual life. Perhaps you could give the reader a sense of that and, 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 and how, how that episode in, in, in Vienna yes. after your ninth birthday affected you so profoundly. Um, one of the um, critical phrases in the post-Holocaust period has been, never forget. And... Um, for people who were exposed to the Hitler period, and my exposure was relatively modest compared to people who went to concentration camps, lost their lives, nonetheless made an indelible impact on my memory. Uh, and I begin by telling this story of uh, my ninth birthday. My father owned a small toy store in Vienna, and for my birthday, he gave me a shiny blue car that I'd very much wanted, which I could control remotely. And I ran that car from November 7th to November 9th through our little apartment on a daily basis. And then on November 9th, this is now about six months after Hitler came into Austria, um, there was a knock on the door and two Nazi policemen came in and informed us we had a few minutes to pack and leave. Um, we were sent to another family's, another Jewish family's apartment, stayed there for a week without knowing, this was my mother, my brother and I, without knowing where my father was, who was incarcerated in this period. When we came back to the apartment, it had been emptied of everything of value, including my toys. Um, and that has stayed with me for all my life. Uh, Hitler came into Vienna on the 13th of March, the next day, I was walking along the street. A boy from my class walked up to me and said, Kandel, <laughs> my father said never to talk to you again. And not a single person in my class spoke to me again. It was a horrifying experience. Uh, after about four or five weeks, we were expelled from the school and sent to an all-Jewish school at the outskirts of town. It's interesting, my brother went to a fairly distinguished gymnasium called the Vasa Gymnasium. Two weeks ago, I got a letter from the Vasa Gymnasium asking me to participate in a ceremony for the hundred students they had expelled from the Vasa Gymnasium. And they said, it's been a long time in coming, but we finally recognized what a horrible event that was. What I think fascinates readers is uh, the way in which memory can actually function. Uh, you talk in your book a great deal about the notion of uh, dualism, that the, the notion that dates back to Descartes, that, that we have body and spirit, and you know, that there was a time when people attributed acts of consciousness or intelligence or memory. The soul. The soul to some other non-bodily right. component. Right. But since at least the 19th century, um, with the rise of phrenology and with the, uh, the, the notion of 
of the, the brain as something that controls sensory and motor activities. Uh, we've thought that the memory could be in the mind. So uh, you start with this phenomenon, which everyone has experienced, of, of being able to recall something from childhood, perhaps in my case, not as dramatic as your own events, but nevertheless uh, um, you know, equal in, in the, the way in which we retain them and can recall them at a moment's notice. And how do you get into the question as a scientist of what memory actually is? How do we retain it? How do we store it? What are the events that a scientist uh, makes use of? Let me begin <coughs> by outlining the problem mm -hmm. as it now exists mm -hmm. and then trace back how I thought about it. Um, we don't understand in detail the complexities of memory storage. We are at the base of a great mountain range and we're just beginning to scale it. We understand how memory is stored at particular sites. We know something about recall of very simple events, mm -hmm. but we don't know how to picture what happened to me in November 9th in our mind. We're just beginning to approach that problem. Uh, when I began to think of how to tackle memory, I went about it in a very naive way. Uh, like yourself, uh, I was trained in literature, and then I got interested in psychoanalysis. I did not have a strong background in science, and I did not know how to think sophisticatedly about how to approach the problem of memory storage. I remember you, you asked someone um, whether you could go in, into their lab to find out where the id and the superego and the I ego are located. unbelievably naive. But I this, this notion that you can locate things within the brain is actually surprising to some people. You read about uh, Phineas Gage having a pipe through his head Absolutely. and his pers personality Absolutely. changes. Absolutely. There's a place in the right. brain By where... By the time you and I came <clears> along, <throat> we realized that mind and brain are inseparable, right. that every mental function is localized to a specific mm -hmm. function in the brain. And that's and a new idea. It's a new idea, mm -hmm. but it's getting more mm -hmm. and more mm -hmm. powerful. And with imaging, we can localize mm -hmm. specific things. We can see specific regions that encode faces, and we can now see how face recall mm -hmm. might occur. Um, so just before I went to the NIH, and as a result of my experience in a laboratory as a medical student, Harry Grinfest, whom I went to, to try to localize the ego <laughs> and the superego, told me, look. I wish we could cut this, the ego out of some people, right? <laughs> this is way beyond what we can do right now. Uh, the best way to approach the brain is to study it one cell at a time. And he got me interested in a key theory, a key approach in all of biology, one that you have used very successfully, is to try to take the problem that you're interested in in its simplest form and try to drive that into the ground. So a cellular approach seemed like a very sensible way to go. Just before I arrived at the NIH, a Brenda Miller, this great psychologist, uh, analyzed a patient called H.M. She was working up in uh, She was in, working in Montreal, in Montreal mm -hmm. but she was called to New Haven mm -hmm. where this operation mm -hmm. was carried out by Bill William Scoville. And he had removed the temporal lobe, the medial temporal lobe from H.M. <clears throat> because he had intractable seizures. That was the only choice left cured the epilepsy. He's still alive today, practically never has a seizure, but he was left with a fantastic memory loss. He could not convert new short-term memory into new long-term memory, so some important storage site for long-term memory, for new long-term memory. And but the old memories were still all there. All memories are in another and... region, not in the medial mm -hmm. temporal lobe. Mm -hmm. And she, through her own earlier experiences and very brilliant insights, inferred that a structure deep to the temporal lobe called the hippocampus mm -hmm. is critically important, and she was absolutely right. When I came to the NIH, um, I thought maybe I would apply a cellular approach to the hippocampus. No one had looked at that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I knew a little bit about how to put electrodes into cells. A lab working next to mine, Carl Frank, was studying the spinal cord with marvelously new techniques for intracellular recordings. Soon after I got started, uh, Alden Spencer, who similarly was recommended to the NIH, came to Wade Marshall's lab where I was working, and he became interested in this problem, and together we had a marvelous collaboration. We were the first ones to obtain intracellular recordings from the region known to be critical for memory storage. And even though Alden was a sophisticated guy, and I was getting progressively more sophisticated, we still had this naive notion, almost like ego, id, and superego, that if we studied these one class of cells well, memory would speak to us. Mm -hmm. 
and we studied them extremely well. In fact, we got a lot of credit for our initial description mm -hmm. of these cells. But we were interested in memory. Other people were just interested in the cell biology of hippocampal neurons. We were interested in behavior, and it did not speak memory to us. What were you expecting to hear? I, I remember we you, you wanted to hear these. We thought the properties were so distinctive that, that they would mm -hmm. have physiological properties different than, different than, than the other cells that. that have been described. And they had some subtle differences that were very nice, uh, but did not speak memory. And mm -hmm. then we realized this is pretty foolish. Memory is a circuit, cells talking to one mm -hmm. another. Cajal, Freud had said, learning and memory probably involves changes in the strength of synaptic connections. Mm -hmm. So I realized what I need to do is to find a system where I can see an actual learning process occur in front of my eyes. Mm -hmm. You use the word, the phrase synaptic connection very facilely, but of course many of our viewers probably nerve don't know what cells, you mean by that. Nerve cells communicate with each other, not randomly, mm -hmm. but at specific sites called synapses, from the Greek term to clasp. Mm -hmm. And there had been a number of people, including Sherrington and Cajal and Freud, who had said that learning is likely to involve changes in the strength of the communication between nerve cells. But when you're naive in the field and you move into it, you read lots of people, you don't know who has prophetic insight and who is just babbling. Of course, there was a debate about how that communication occurred. Exactly, whether it's electrical, whether it's electric, or chemical. chemical. So even that was just beginning to be resolved. And so the first thing we did was to try to see whether we can figure out how sensory information comes into the hippocampus. It turns out the hippocampus represents very complex mm -hmm. sensory information. And using single sensory stimuli, which we used, didn't get us anywhere. So I thought we had to take a completely new approach. Listen to Grunfest, I said. Find the simplest situation in which learning occurs. So I looked around at lots of experimental systems, lots of animals, mm -hmm. and I looked at crayfish and lobsters and leeches, and I finally honed in on a marine snail, a plisia. Not because it tasted better than lobster. No, it tastes nowhere as good as lobster. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us a little bit about the snail. The how, snail how, is a wonderful, small, big... wonderful, it's a giant snail about a foot mm -hmm. in length. It gives out a, a brilliantly purple ink mm -hmm. when you in any way threaten it. And its great attraction to me was the fact that it has the largest nerve cells in the animal mm -hmm. kingdom. Before I became presbyopic, I could see the cells with my naked eye. Uh, moreover, it became clear to me after working with it for a while that not only were the cells gigantic, but they're so distinctive mm -hmm. that you can give them names. You could call one Harold, the other one Eric, Connie, Denise, mm -hmm. and you could come back to the same cell in every animal of the species. You could work out the communication pattern, how the cells talk to one another. You could work out how these cells relate to sensory and motor structures. You could work out a whole reflex. But we don't think of a snail as having a particularly vivid memory life. So but you tell, know, tell, tell us about the equivalent uh, of memory. That's a very interesting question. It, it uh, dawned on me, and this is not original with me, people, uh, the ethologists certainly have been aware of it, that um, to learn and to remember is essential for survival. You have to know where f the food sources are and where the prey and the predators are. And they're likely to be in distinctive places and you want to be able to distinguish one place from another, distinguish them by appearance, etc. So you have to learn these things and recall them. Much of life mm -hmm. is acquired through experience, much of one's knowledge. And so it was clear that any process that is so important for an animal's survival is going to be retained in evolution, it's going to be conserved. And one trick all biologists know is that if evolution finds something that works, it holds on to it indefinitely. And I thought that if I found a mechanism of learning, and there are lots, going to be lots of mechanisms, but if I found a mechanism of learning in an animal, no matter how simple the animal, no matter how simple the task, it would ultimately lead me to it ego and superego, I'm joking, it would ultimately lead me to an insight that would have general importance. There would be modifications, there would be frills, there would be extensions, but that the basic mechanisms might hold up. And I think, by and large, this has been true. So tell us about a, a, a memory event in the, okay. in the, in the so, life of Aplysia uh, so, and how, so, how you uh, studied uh, it. Right. So Aplysia can learn a number of things. For example, it learns that if you give it... I, I first they worked out a very simple reflex in the animal. The animal has an external uh, respiratory organ, mm 
like a lung. It's outside the body. It's called the gill. And it's normally protected by a sheet of skin. But in order to extract oxygen from the seawater, it usually is exposed. It is often exposed. And if you touch part of the overlying skin, you get a brisk retraction, both of this overlying mantle shelf and of the gill, the respiratory organ. So you can modify the intensity of that reflex. So I'm looking at variations in reflex intensity uh, by three means. Uh, one is if you give a very weak touch, the gill will withdraw because it expects something serious. But if the touch continues to be weak, it realizes this is boring and uninteresting and it stops responding to it. That is a phenomenon that occurs in people. It's called habituation. You learn to ignore lots of stimuli at Sloan Kettering because they distract you from the task. Mm -hmm. You can't survive at Columbia if you pay attention <laughs> to all kinds of irrelevant stimuli. Academic life is a question of appropriate habituation. <laughs> and the inverse. Mm -hmm. If you give a noxious stimulus to the tail of the animal, you startle it. And now that same neutral stimulus that would produce just at best a modest reflex will produce a more powerful reflex. That's called sensitization. And that's what I've studied most extensively. If you pair the neutral stimulus with the tail shock, you can actually produce classical conditioning like Pavlov did. So here I had in this absolutely simple animal three significant forms of learning, which I could characterize behaviorally. And I could see, is this stored as memory? And you find that if you produce any of these procedures in one training trial, let's say one stimulus or a few stimuli, the animal will remember it for a period of hours, then forgets and goes back to the basal state. But in the snail, as in you and me, practice makes perfect. So if you repeat the training, the animal will remember this for days and weeks. And it turns out, when you look into the nervous system, there are distinctive mechanisms for learning and short-term memory. They're very much related. But long-term memory is fundamentally different. And I've really spent you know, the next 40 years exploring those differences. For most of our viewers, um, the notion of understanding memory, of course, is an extraordinary idea. But for most of them, the, the real interest is in the aberrations of memory. On the one hand, people who have extraordinary memory and can look at a page and, me and remember it like that. That's a phenomenon which we'd like to hear a little bit about. But of course, for most of us, the real issue is loss of memory, whether it occurs as a consequence of strokes and Alzheimer's disease or whether it's simply a concomitant of, of aging. And uh, I think all of us would like to know whether you can understand how the ability to form memory um, and to retain it, is, how that is, uh, is, is conceived these days, and, and whether there's any uh, prospect of either being able to retrieve memories that are lost or to prevent the gradual loss of uh, the capacity to, to create memory. Um, I think one of the wonderful things about biological science is in our lifetime, and I must say you had a significant role in this, was to um, point basic science in the direction where its findings can give rise to new treatments, translational uh, science. And even in this very simple system, and in the last 15 years I've paralleled that with studies in mice, uh, we've been able to get insights into all of these processes. When I say we, I speak of we as I do in the book, mm -hmm. the my generation sure. in the scientific community. Let me just give you a s couple of examples. The critical thing that we found in memory storage, and that has turned out to be very general, is that short-term memory involves a transient strengthening in the communication between nerve cells that's mediated by signaling systems whose time course is minutes to hours. With long-term memory, with repeated training, the signaling systems move into the nucleus, and there they turn on genes. So when you and I have a conversation, insofar as you remember it, and I don't urge this on you, but insofar <laughs> as you remember it, I'll it's do my best. <laughs> It's because genes will be altered in your brain. Now, that doesn't surprise you. At this point, it doesn't surprise me. But many people think that the genes are the determinants of behavior. To realize that in the brain, in nerve cells, genes are the servants of the environment is a bit surprising. I must say, it was a bit surprising to me, coming from a non-genetic background, number one. Number two, there is a specific activator of genes, 
called CREB. The name is unimportant. But when you activate it, you not only have to put this onto the appropriate promoter of a gene, the control region of a gene, but you have to get rid of an inhibitory constraint called a repressor. If you artificially remove that repressor, that mouse or that snail has a perfect memory. Everything you put into short-term memory immediately gets converted into long-term memory. So I became interested in memorists because my memory is reasonably good, but it's not great. Mm -hmm. And I learned to my delight that those people are miserable. <laughs> they do, feel as if their head is filled with garbage. No. But do they, in fact, lack the Krebs inhibitor? That we don't know. That mm -hmm. obviously is something that one can now find out. Mm -hmm. People are beginning to look, and there are, in fact, alterations in long-term memory that a group in Frankfurt has found with variations of CREB1, the mm -hmm. activator. They have not yet looked at the repressor, CREB2. Mm -hmm. So what's, what are the prospects for inhibiting the, pre the CREB inhibitor well, as think, a means I for think those enhancing are, those memory are, people who are losing those it? Those are interesting ideas. Um, in 1990, mm -hmm. when Smythes and Kempecki developed methods mm -hmm. for knocking out genes in mice, it became obvious to me, as it did mm -hmm. to many other people, that mice are going to be fantastic systems for applying genetics to study complex behavior, learning and memory, well described in the mouse. Mm -hmm. um, and so I began to see to what degree the insights we had in the plesia applied. And a number of things apply very nicely, including this long-term memory step. Mm -hmm. um, and then I realized that, you know, mice age. And as people age, they show age-related memory loss. Mm -hmm. Now, if you take 100 people age 70 and have no sign of illness, uh, no depression, uh, no anxiety state, have no major cognitive deficits, and you give them subtle tests for memory, you find 40 perform as you do, as they did in their 30s. Mm -hmm. But 60% have a mild memory deficit. If you follow them over time, initially indistinguishable, if you follow them over time, you find that 30 show a very mild progression, and that's called benign senescent forgetfulness or non-Alzheimer age-related memory loss. And the other 30% show this devastating, horrible, progressive memory loss that ultimately shows loss in other cognitive functions and motor ability as well. Um, mice don't show spontaneous Alzheimer's disease, you have to express in them genes that produce that, but they show in the same percentage age-related memory loss. And my colleagues and I looked at that, uh, and we found that the signaling pathway that we had found is important in turning on long-term memory to activate CREB, this transcriptional factor, is in fact compromised in these mice. And if you take an off-the-shelf compound, Rolopram, and boost up the cyclic AMP system, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you can restore the physiological deficit and you can get a mouse that acts like it's a young mouse. Mm -hmm. So if you were a mouse, Harold, we you could treat you. <laughs> That's reassuring. People, we don't know. So Wally Gilbert is a very good friend of mine. Denise and I were having dinner one night together and I was describing these things and Denise said, you should start a company. I hope you gave her some stock. <laughs> she has half of my right. shares. Um, and we started a company called Memory Pharmaceuticals, mm -hmm. which is now a public company. Mm -hmm. I did that together with Jonathan Flanwick and Axel Unterbeck. And uh, we're trying to develop not just along this pathway, mm -hmm. but in a number of pathways to develop drugs for this. There are lots of companies out there. And I feel quite confident that um, in the next 10 years, not only in age-related memory loss, but even in Alzheimer's disease, where I've made no contribution at all, <clears throat> but the field has made wonderful contributions in understanding um, what goes wrong in the brain, um, that there will be uh, much better treatments than there are right now. Right now, the treatments are marginal. Now, your book is called uh, The Emerging Science of the Mind, and, of course, the mind is more than memory. Yes. I think for many people, the notion that uh, we're studying how the mind works is an invitation to think not only about memory and learning and things of that sort, but to think about... Uh, behavioral functions, in particular about, about mental illness. And uh, historically, of course, uh, the notion of mental illness was not necessarily viewed as a, the product of a, of a physically or chemically altered mind, but as something that could be reflect uh, habitations by demons and other 
other spiritual ways of, of, of looking at the disease. But from what you've seen the world of neuroscience uncover in the last 50 years or so, uh, what do you think we can say now about uh, the, the physical and, chem and, and chemical changes in the, in, in, the, in the brain that reflect those disorders of the mind that we, that we call psychiatric illnesses? After all, you began as a, as a Freudian, That's moved right. away from That's that. Right. I'd like to talk a little bit about your view of therapies, but let's talk a little bit at first about what you're, no, absolutely. How, you, the how you understand the biological basis of mental disease. And, and we understand disease. them uh, insufficiently, but much, much better than we did before. <clears throat> um, let me put this into historical background because you raise an interesting point. Until quite recently, even a component of the psychiatric community treated mental illness as if it was abiological. Um, the um, the uh, Statistical Diagnostic Manual of the mm -hmm. American Psychiatric Association made a distinction between two kinds of mental illnesses, organic mental illness and functional mental illness. Organic mental illness were things like um, psychosis due to syphilis, or brain tumor, brain or tumors, no. alcoholism, no. and that diagnosis was made in, in the 1900s, in the early 1900s, when pathologists in Vienna were slicing the brain, and if they saw a big hole in a patient who had a psychotic no. illness, they said, this is organic. If they didn't see any obvious anatomical damage, they said, this is functional. Mm -hmm. As we now know, depression and schizophrenia is quite subtle. They, they didn't pick any of that up. So they called even these severe mm. mental illnesses functional as if they were occurring outside the body. We know that this is silly. Mm -hmm. uh, and we know several hard facts about those illnesses. We know both of them, first of all, are quite prevalent. Depression, 10% of the population one time or another. Schizophrenia, 1% worldwide. Mm -hmm. We know that 50% of the illness is accounted by genes. Mm -hmm. We know that unlike Huntington's disease or Fragile X, which is called by a single gene and the inheritance pattern is very direct, very complex inheritance, number of different genes interacting, each with a small effect, and since that only accounts for 50%, there is an additional insult. It's a double insult disease. And we're beginning to define a little bit what that second end cell is. For example, if the mother suffers from malnutrition, there are wonderful studies on, on hungers in Holland during the Second World War. Infection of the mother, interuterine infection, uh, trauma during birth, all of them predispose a bit towards schizophrenia. The, apparently, the age of the sperm, the father's sperm, is very important. Elderly fathers are slightly more likely to produce children have schizophrenia. Uh, so, number one, we're beginning to get some insight into the biological causes. Mm -hmm. We're also getting some insights into the anatomical deficits. Uh, there is, from Pat Goldman, Rakic's work, and a number of other people work, Joachim Frister, uh, Danny Weinberger, very good evidence that the prefrontal cortex, which is involved in a short-term memory called working memory, is impaired. That was shown by a Swedish group to be um, abnormally um, involved when you do imaging experiments. You see that normally when you do a cognitive task, the blood flow to the prefrontal cortex increases. Patients with schizophrenia have a lower level to begin with, and when they do a cognitive task, it actually decreases. So this is important in organizing the person's life, in allowing them to order things sequentially, that is defective. So we're really beginning to get a beginning insight into the anatomy. And most important, we have for depression and schizophrenia treatments. They vary in the excellence. In depression, I think one can say treatments are really pretty good, 70 to 90 percent. Of by treatment, are you talking about cognitive therapy or, I'm sorry. or, or, or drug I'm therapy? I'm speaking about drug therapy. Psychotherapy? I, I, want to, I want to come to psychotherapy in a moment. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are now drugs available, they have been available since the 60s, um, that are very effective in the treatment of depression. Um, we have drugs that are quite effective in schizophrenia, but I, make, I reserve that. Let me tell you why. Schizophrenia is a complex disorder that has three types of symptoms. Cognitive, which we talked about, prefrontal cortex, mm -hmm. negative and positive. The positive symptoms 
is what one generally thinks of, the, the uh, general public thinks of schizophrenia. It's sort of the craziness, the hallucinations, the illusions, the, 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 the abnormal behavior. Mm -hmm. um, the negative symptoms are shyness, mm -hmm. what is sometimes called a schizoid personality, awkwardness in interaction. And the cognitive symptoms are the fact that life is disorganized, they don't hold on to things very well. The positive symptoms, the hallucinations and delusions respond very well to the antipsychotic agents. The other two class of symptoms uh, respond very little to them. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously what one needs to do is to come up to a better approaches for that. And people are trying to get drugs that work outside the dopamine system, which is the mm -hmm. one that's in, involved uh, in, in the, uh, in, in the uh, uh, positive symptoms. It's interesting to me in reading your book that, that in a sense you and Freud moved in opposite directions. That he began as a neuroanatomist. Wonderful, wonderful and, neuroanatomist. And, and became, in fact, a, a, a became uh, a, the, uh, the, the leader of the field of psychoanalysis, whereas you began with an interest in psychoanalysis and, and uh, behavioral studies and, and moved more and more into a reductionist physical, uh, chemical uh, Without approach. in any way comparing myself to Freud, I think well, we both did the right thing. the purpose thing. of this show, actually, it makes it a, a more dramatic uh, <laughs> contrast. Let, so. let, me, let me tell you why I think we both did the right thing. Freud came from a biological mm -hmm. tradition. And he left biology for two reasons. Um, one is that in order to do research in his period, um, you needed to be financially independent, and he was not. Um, so he needed to have a practice. Uh, and in your time and mine, this was no longer the case. The government had moved into research in a major way and supported, until recently, uh, science very effectively. Uh, number two, he wanted to develop a biology of mind. He came close to discovering independently of Cajal that the nerve cell is the basic unit of the brain. Nerve cells talk to each other through these synaptic connections, and these connections change with learning. He wrote this in 1894, the same year Cajal wrote it. I remember you're showing me a diagram that, that Freud had, yes. uh, had had put together, and this is, this is not very well known, but the, a picture he, of circuitry he, he of cells in the brain. He wrote a manuscript which he put into right. his drawer, was not published until after his death. Anyway, why did he leave the biology of the mind? He left because he felt it was so immature, so underdeveloped, that it bore no relationship to higher cognitive functions. I must say, as I indicated earlier, that's still true today, except we feel so delusionally confident in biology that we can go all the way that, you know, we start the road, knowing that if we don't continue, someone else will. In, so I think he did a wise thing. Rather than speculate about the fact that the uh, uh, lateral geniculus is involved in such and such and the lateral pedunculus is involved in such and such, he developed an abstract model of the mind and quite inspirational despite the fact, like all models, it was flawed. I came along at a different time, at a time when biology was beginning to open up, and um, I received a lot of encouragement to have a career like this. Um, and in my lifetime, my science has progressed much more dramatically than psychoanalysis had. So I feel very privileged to have taken this alternate route, as Freud had every right to feel privileged that he had taken that route. Mm -hmm. One of the things that comes across very clearly in your book is the sense in which science is a community of scholars that, that can be arranged both historically and laterally. That is, uh, you're very, I'm very conscious as a reader of your book in the, uh, the, the impact of, uh, of early efforts to do neuroscience in the 18th and 19th century, uh, the influence of Freud as we've been discussing, and then the influence of your mentors, the influence of colleagues who work closely with you Dominic Perper, who's a dean here now, who worked side by side with you at one time, Alden Spectrum, who you've mentioned, uh, and, uh, and, and, and Jimmy Schwartz, who, who died just right, uh, right. last week, who was a very close colleague and engaged in a partnership with you yes, at one time, yes, which yes. I, I find an interest, having been a partner my, myself with Mike Bishop for many years, it's a very interesting uh, way to arrange your life as a, as a scientist. It's I wonder if you could say a little about this, uh, working let, with let Jimmy. Me, and, let me just, <coughs> before I get into no, my own no, colleagues, let no. me say something about this. Most people don't realize that we're a special community and we have very special relationships with one another. Let me remind you the origins of this book. May I, Harold? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, a couple of days after I won the Nobel Prize, you mm -hmm. called me mm -hmm. and you said, uh, 
Eric, I, I think I need to talk to you about what you should prepare for your visit to Stockholm. Um, one and I ride my bicycle up to your office, and I said to myself, my God, the president of Sloan County, no, no, Harold, I will come and visit you. And we had a wonderful chat together, and you said, you know the Nobel autobiography, most people don't take it seriously, get started on it right away. Um, the lecture, you're going to have to give it in a couple of months. You're going to have to submit it soon thereafter, get going on it. And I don't know whether you remember this, but I sent you a copy yes, of my autobiography, which is I the did. beginning of that book, and you were very gracious about it at the, at the time. In that, in in the book, I make the point. It was <clears> one of the longest Nobel autobiographies it, of all time, if, if I recall it correctly. Out to be, as Tom Jessler pointed out. <laughs> so I'm responsible out. for that. <laughs> you are responsible for that. Um, and the, I don't know whether this was true for you as well with with Mike Bishop and your wonderful collaboration. Um, but since I really taught myself science, mm -hmm. as I became a scientist, I had the opportunity at each stage of my career of interacting with people as colleagues, as collaborators, who brought their discipline to bear on our common science, our common um, experiments, but who in the process taught me a great deal. And in some cases, since they didn't know any neurobiology, I may have passed off some neurobiology to them. It began with Alden Spencer. I knew more electrophysiology at the beginning than he did. I had put electrodes into single cells. He had not quite done that before. But he knew a lot about the anatomy of the brain. He knew a lot about functional organization. He was a wonderful collaboration. Uh, later on, I worked with a colleague called Richard Cargishall, a superb anatomist who did the first anatomical studies uh, of aplysia, and later with Craig Bailey. One of the wonderful things we found is that long-term memory, when you turn on genes, gives rise to the growth of new synaptic connections. So to continue the metaphor, if your genes get turned on and you remember this tomorrow, it's because you'll have a slightly different brain than you had before. Then when I got to the point of wanting to understand the biochemistry, Jimmy Schwartz. Now, I'd known Jimmy since college. We had been friends. He had come from a very different tradition. He'd worked with Lipman on bacterial protein synthesis. He, we were recruited to NYU as junior faculty at the same time, and he got interested in the nervous system. I should point out that um, by mid-65, as the genetic code was being solved, a lot of molecular biologists moved into the brain as one of the new frontiers, and Jimmy was in that coterie. Um, and he was interested in doing something in the brain, and somebody had told him, please, is a good system to work, and it was from a biochemist's dream. Large cells, you could dissect them out, you can see how does a cell differ from that cell. And we know now that nerve cells communicate with each other through chemicals. Those chemicals are called neurotransmitters, and different neurons use different neurotransmitters. He identified the first neurotransmitters in the aplysia brain. It's a wonderful uh, set of findings. Uh, later on, we collaborated on the early studies of learning. He was critically involved in defining the signaling pathways in short-term memory. And then he and I collaborated with Paul Greengard to push that analysis even further. Superb scientist. And we continued our friendship until he died. I've talked about a number of things that have interested me as a fellow scientist about your book. But it does occur to me, as I see you and several others of my colleagues, writing not just textbooks or compendia of their scientific work, but instead books that talk about their lives and the relationship of their work in science to society, that there must be something you're trying to reach uh, when, you, when, you would, when you talk to the public as an author. Uh, after all, most of us lead lives that, on a daily basis, are pretty dull, look, at least viewed from the outside. We go to our labs, we meet with our students, it's fun for us, but it's not particularly accessible to the average person. So as you wrote this book, what, what did you have in mind as a, as a, as a, well, as a you know, a, a, I mean, after all, you, I, I know from, from uh, conversations with you that you struggled with the book. You, absolutely. you missed a lot of uh, openings of art e exhibitions. You, you uh, denied yourself good dinners. Uh, you, you probably infuriated your wife from time to time and, and uh, yet. And children. But, but, uh, but there, there must have been a motivation here that I think yes. uh, the public would like to know about. Why does a scientist write a book that, that uh, tries to explain science to the public and also paint a picture of uh, the I scientific community I think there are obviously several uh, 
different purposes one has in writing the book. But one I certainly felt, and this again is not original with me, um, that the public is embedded mm -hmm. in a technological world mm -hmm. that it is by and large not equipped to handle. And that we, the scientific community, have not succeeded in conveying to the public an understanding of the issues. Um, as must be the case with you, I give a number of public lectures, and I'm amazed how interested people are in what I work on. Uh, and I thought, since I have enjoyed teaching medical students, I've done some teaching to undergraduates, I love teaching. I love explaining things to people. Um, that it would be wonderful if I could succeed, even partially, in conveying the excitement of the mind to other people. In addition, most people do not understand what a wonderful life we lead. What a sensual pleasure, intellectual sensuality it is, to show up in the lab, you know, at my age, 76, surrounded by people in the late 20s and early 30s, you know, just filled with ideas, and to talk to them on a daily level, daily basis is just marvelous. Uh, and I thought I would try to communicate. There is, of course, another message in your book which comes out of your own circumstances, and that has to do with the role of America as a place that, that, uh, that accepts immigrants and offers them an opportunity. And uh, you know, now, as a Nobel laureate of some years standing, uh, you are in a position to, to deliver messages of that kind in a way that has a powerful impact. And I wonder if there, if there are things in this book that you want the public to appreciate about our country, our society, the way in which society supports science, the way in which America can act as a beacon. After you were, you were an immigrant who was, who was essentially the result of push. You didn't know you wanted to be a neuroscientist. Indeed, even 10 years later, you were still interested in being an historian. Uh, so you were not pulled here because yep, of our yep, universities. Yep, you were, you were yep. pushed here. Now, of course, uh, you know, there, there is still a, a large push factor, but there's also a pull factor because our universities are extraordinary. Um, are, are there messages that you're trying to convey about yes, contemporary yes, life yes, in America yes, that, that yes. are worth pointing out Several now? things. First of all, belonging to university is a fantastic opportunity. And I consider myself privileged to be at Columbia, as people should at other universities, and I think by and large they do. I mean, look what you did at University of California, San Francisco. I mean, the group of you helped build a great medical center and joined a special camaraderie enjoyed a, a special camaraderie in doing that. I've had the same privilege with Jimmy Schwartz and Richard Axel and Tom Jessel at Columbia. Uh, and we have a president who is interested in the biology of mind, and we're developing a new campus mm -hmm. devoted to that due to Dawn Indeed, Green's Indeed, just a few days ago, a announced. marvelous gift was received yes. to allow you to yes. join yes. the science of, neuro of, of, of neurobiology with, with, the, with behavior and yes. with yes. memory and yes. other, yes. other yes. And this has been until recently, the American experience. I mean, I have had a wonderfully privileged experience that I could not have had anywhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, in high school, John Campana, my teacher, gave me the money to apply to Harvard. At every point, I felt the benefit of an open society. Uh, and we have had wonderful support from the government and from private philanthropy to do science. When I applied to go abroad to try to work in a plesia. A lot of people thought that was crazy, but the NIH supported it. Mm -hmm. In the early years, no one who was competent was not supported. In the period that you were director of the NIH, there was a doubling of the budget because the workforce in this country has increased dramatically because we've encouraged it. It's the engine that drives the economy. We're in a very difficult phase right now. That Tremendous increase has dissipated. Everyone is having difficult time getting funding. And I'm frankly worried about us. I'm worried about the young people coming along and will they have the fantastic career opportunities that you and I had. I'm worried about the leadership that America has historically exercised in the world, the leadership for good in science. Uh, will we be able to maintain that? Um, when I was young, people invariably went to Europe to train. Now everyone comes to the United States. Our universities are really one of our greatest sources of strength in the country. And with the difficulty of people getting visas, 
uh, with the difficulty of support, that whole edifice is being somewhat threatened. Mm -hmm. I'm slightly worried. Another thing you talk about in the book that uh, is, I think, perhaps surprising to some people is the extent to which art makes a difference in your life. Yes. And uh, I wonder if you could say a little bit about your own interests in, in art, how they rose, how they arose, what, uh, what things you like now. Um. It, it is amazing. At one point, I cite Orson Welles, um, who, um, after doing The Third Man, came back to Vienna and did a, 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 sh a short film on Vienna, a documentary, and, and said, um, the Vienna that never was is the grandest city ever. And I have a fantasy <laughs> life about Vienna, uh, which I never, you know, I never partook of it intellectually when I was, I was nine years old. And so I enjoy Viennese culture a great deal. I like, you know, Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven. Um, I collect Austrian and German expressionists on paper. I have quite a nice collection. I have Klimt Chilis and Kokoschkas. Uh, Denise, my wife, um, has a wonderful, she was in France and she was in hiding in the south of France in a convent for a year and a half. Um, but she, I gather her relatives think of Vienna as Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I describe her aunt interviewing me the first time I had dinner at uh, <laughs> Denise's mother's house. Where are you from? I said, Vienna. Very nice. We used to call that little Paris. <laughs> Um, she collects, uh, we collect together, but it's her stimulus, uh, Art Nouveau furniture, mm -hmm. French Art Nouveau furniture and lamps and vases. We have a very nice collection. This is not a world-class collection, but we enjoy it a great deal. A house is filled with little things that we enjoy. And you know, that is an enormous pleasure for me. I must say my friends, Jimmy Schwartz is a wonderful collector. Richard Axel collects Munch. Jessel collects British artists. This is not unique. Uh, with me as a neurobiologist, many of my friends uh, collect. Eric, when, um, when I think of you and you're not in front of me, I, I see you as you are now, that is, smiling. In fact, most scientists, the characteristic Candelian um, posture is one of uh, you know, a, a hearty laugh. And yet you picture yourself on your book with a, a level of seriousness that will be surprising to many of your friends and colleagues. Why? This is not me. This is Marianna Cook. Uh, Marianna Cook, who took a wonderful picture of you oh, with a bicycle. You. Thank you. Uh, insisted that I take off my glasses mm -hmm. and that I not smile. Mm -hmm. And she took 400 shots, roughly, plus or minus 10, of me sitting in a chair looking like that. Um, and she wanted to get beyond the glasses and beyond mm -hmm. the smile into some... Because for many of us, of course, the... the, 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 the essence of Candell is joy in life of science, life of the mind, working on a problem that, uh, that is of inherent interest to anyone. You know, I, I'm, I'm burdened with the, with the difficulty of studying cancer, which everyone's interested in because they're fearful of it, but they're, you know, other than the, the notion of a general interest in how cells work, I think nobody gravitates intellectually toward the normal life of the cell quite as much as they do to the normal life of the brain, which, um, which has um, you know, the, the capacity to appreciate music and art, to, re to retain memories of childhood, to, uh, 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 to appreciate the, the, the beauties of uh, the outdoor life. The biology of mind is fantastic. It is an extraordinary story. Yeah. And, and for that reason, I think all of us uh, uh, look on you as someone who escaped um, a, a, a a serious threat to your life as a child, uh, came to America, had a remarkable career, um, and have every, every reason to, to smile. I think one of the, one of the things that, uh, uh, that comes out of your book, uh, much to your credit, is the idea that this is a life not only well-lived for the purpose of, uh, of um, enlarging knowledge, but a life lived with gusto and appreciation and enjoyment and good humor. I think that's true. I mean, this is not to say there are not moments of misery. I don't want to... Well, <laughs> I, 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 think, I think everyone appreciates the idea that scientists have a great deal of misery sure, in their life. But. Sure, sure. Uh, I think that's true. I, I think uh, 
So I'm trying to make a larger point about right. the scientific life, which um, I think the scientific is often portrayed life is a privileged life. As, uh, you know, the privilege of Let me let me simply explain. And, uh, and there and, are conflicts and suspicions. And, We're dealing with other human beings, um, but look at you and me. I mean. Um, we are in different disciplines, we're different ages, and yet, you know, we've sh we share so much together. I can actually disagree with you about the nature of cancer and your own contribution, which showed that cancer genes are within us. They really are alterations in critical steps in cellular function. Fantastic insight. Well, that's but not I'm not going to argue. <laughs> I'm not going to argue that. The biology of the mind is a fabulous area, and let me just expand on it a little bit. Um, Obviously, we're very far from understanding higher mental processes, but even at this early stage, one can see, and Columbia hopes to exploit that in what it calls a mind-brain behavior initiative, to see to what degree can the biology of mind unite the sciences to the humanities, C.P. Snow's Great Divide. And in certain areas, one can already see progress. For example, you cannot be a practicing psychologist without you know, asking interesting questions about behavior that ultimately must be related to the brain. And every good cognitive psychologist is, in fact, a neurobiologist right now. And I think those fields have not only come together, but we will be one. Philosophy of mind, you know, every one of those people, John Searle, Pat Churchland, they're all neurobiologists. Economists interested in the biology of decision making and neurobiologists studying decision making are being influenced by models developed by the economists. Art, as you pointed out, the appreciation of works of art, the aesthetic response, the nature of creativity, which we know, just beginning to know something about, uh, ethics, all these issues neurobiology touches on and is influenced by. So we would hope to create dialogues between various disciplines in the humanities and the neurobiology of mind. Well, Eric. Always looking to the future and uh, in which you're going to play a major role. Thank you very much for being with us tonight. Uh, thank you very much for doing this, Harold.